Welcome back, everybody, to now our uh, second uh, episode on Hegel's uh, philosophy of uh, world history, his lecture series. Yeah. Yeah, welcome back. Uh, it's, it's good that we are pushing ahead. <laughs> Showing it's up bloody, is half the work. It's bloody hard, yeah. Showing up is half the work. Um, so last week, we just introduced the lectures a bit. We spoke about the different kinds of history, original history, reflective history, philosophical history. And what we're here, what we're here to do is philosophical history. If you want to know what that is, check out the previous episode. Uh, but today we're going to do the first three subheadings of the next section, which is the idea of human freedom. And we were sort of getting at this last week when we were talking about what the sort of the subject matter of philosophical world history is it's about the self-realization of freedom in this section hegel really starts to go into more depth yeah so let's begin with the first spot uh, the do you have anything else you want to say to as a by way of introduction before we yeah so i i think uh I think I'm just going to add a little bit to what you were saying, maybe yeah. not in substance that much, but uh, so we, we talked about what his, the ways, types of history last time and how Hegel sort of understands those ways in which we understand history or world history, but that he sees there is a particular subject or content matter that is developing and evolving through history. And that can be encapsulated in a single idea or a single concept. And as you said, Ahilius, it's freedom, human freedom. And that is kind of what we're, what we're getting into, or Hegel will be getting into in the sections that are ahead of us today. Yeah. So want to know what history is all about for Hegel? Well, it's going to sit tight and we'll find out. Yeah, yeah. Great. So we've got the fabric of world history then. This is, you know, there's a really short little subheading. It's kind of an introduction. And it seems to me that Hegel wants to emphasize the idea that when we're talking about human freedom, what we're interested in is what he also calls human will. Uh, the externalization, the actualization of let's say, interests, or he also uses the word passions. I think this is still a very, as he says, an abstract basis of freedom. It's sort of a, we're not really getting to the, we're not getting to a really concrete understanding of what it is yet. But broadly speaking, this is what Hegel wants us to think about when, we, when, when, he, when he writes that we're, we're investigating human freedom. It's the way the human will externalize itself, actualize itself. And as we said previously, it's been particular in, in deeds, in works, in things that have historical consequences. Yeah, and that uh, Hegel points out here that the human will is the abstract basis for freedom. So it is through human will and willing, wanting to do certain things. And, and it's not just wanting to do things. I think Hegel, for Hegel, will is something action, actionable, right? It's something you do, but you know that you're doing it. Um, so that's how he cl classifies will. And that's different from desire and, and other things, even though desires may be involved in will. Uh, but will itself, is a little bit of a placeholder and sort of empty, right? Because what is it you're willing, right? Um, and Hegel will have different answers to, with regards to what you ultimately want or will. Uh, but at this point, I think he's just highlighting that um, people might be willing certain things, have certain motivations, drives, and so forth. And that leads them to do things but they might not be aware of the full outcome of their actions. 
Mm. And I think here is where history is going to be playing an important role in trying to give us greater awareness of our actions and the willing that was um, motivated those actions and drove those actions such that ultimately we are actually kind of coming to know ourselves and our will and adapting that will, developing that will, such that, that the outcomes become more and more rational. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good. He will uh, continuously emphasize the distinction between the rational process that is history and then the rational process that is the understanding of the rational process that is history. And this is what we're doing now. We're discerning the implicit rationality in, in what people have willed. But not just anything. We're talking about significant acts of will. Things that, things that warrant a place in world history as ethical shapes or shapes of world history. One thing that might be so Hegel then goes on to distinguish. He says so in the on page one four seven. He says thus we have here the idea as the totality of ethical freedom. Two elements are salient: first, the idea itself as abstract, and second, the human passions. I think we briefly touched upon this in last week's discussion. I think. You can you might read this and you might think Hegel is a kind of an idealist here, or he comes across as an idealist. The idea is a substantial power, but considered for itself, it is only the universal. The passions of humanity are the arm by which it actualizes itself. You get the that calling it the substantial power, making a distinction between the substantial power and that which actualizes itself could make Hegel sound like someone who thinks that there is just this substrata of rationality that is our unconscious motivation for why we're doing something. It's sort of pushing us to do something. And we're, we're just, we're just puppets which is ways of it to actualize it itself. And I think we should resist that. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Because I think when he says the passions of humanity are the arm by which it, the idea as substantial power actualizes itself. I really think, you know, th this is what, this is Hegel's insistence on the particulars on individuals. And as anyone who has read the first chapter of the concept in the logic will know, the universal is the individual, the universal is the particular. And Hegel's idea of freedom then is this, this unity of these two sides of this, this universal substantial power. What that is exactly, I think we still need to unpack. It's not entirely clear, but also the actualization of this uh, universal substantial power, which is done through the passions of humanity. Again, what exactly that means, we have to unpack. Philip, what do you think about this? Yeah, I think Hegel is setting out here a kind of straightforward philosophical concept in the sense of like, yes, we are distinguishing two things here, right? The idea itself, right, as abstract, and then the human passions on the other, or human action, or even say. Uh, but don't think for a moment that these two things exist independently from each other. They exist together in some kind of unity, right, in some kind of relationship with one another, but also don't make the second mistake of thinking that they just collapse into that unity, right, mm. that they are just, there isn't such a thing as idea or human passions um, you know, have any kind of independent uh, standing or worth on their own. No, we have to think the two kind of levels together that they are related to one another, yet also distinct. And there can be a way in which 
the uh, one is very minimized and kind of obscured, which I think, as we will be getting to later, is how history first unfolds, is that we're doing a bunch of stuff, yet <laughs> it often ends in mistakes or failure or torment or suffering because we don't yet know the full scope of what our actions can, the outcome of our actions. Mm. But it's not to, that doesn't mean that there is never any idea at work in it. Otherwise, I don't think we'll be, we would ever be able to uh, grasp what we're doing and become aware of it and see the sense that is at work, however, only in kind of its minimal form. Because at that point, we would just be animals. We'd just be yeah. doing things instinctively. But we're not. We're aware of ourselves doing things, and we recognize there are errors. The fact that we recognize our, there are errors speaks to a standard that is at work, that, we, um, that is working through us. Mm. And then Hegel does um, add on to this that these two extremes have a midpoint, and he calls that ethical freedom. So where human passions and the you know, idea, the fully rational meet, is in ethical actions, doing what you think is right, um, which I think we will unpack as we move along in this uh, text. On these yeah. yeah, yeah. So do you think we should understood, understand ethical freedom? Because we've spoken about the idea, we've spoken about the actualization of freedom. Do you think a good general way to understand ethical freedom as this midpoint is as the actualization of the idea, the self-actualization of the of reason, of however we want to put it? Yeah. The actualization of the idea, insofar as we also take into account that it's unified with human passion. Yeah. Because I think without human passion, nothing ever gets done. Mm. Nobody is motivated do anything so yeah. i think hegel is on the side of hume hobbes and mill on this score that yeah if you take away incentives and uh, sentimentality people are going to stop doing stuff yeah well he says he says in the previous section um paraphrasing now but all there is is uh, human interests yeah and it's clear how important it is for him this idea that what moves things are these interests, things we might consider to be of less importance. Um, but for Hegel, it's what makes, it's what is the actualization of the idea. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. then. So, in the final paragraph of the section, he tells us we must not speak in wholly abstract terms. Rather, we grasp the idea in the concrete shape of spirit, not as a logical idea. So not as the way we thought about it in the science of logic, but in the concrete shape of spirit, of objective spirit, right? Because we are in the sphere of objective spirit in one of the final sections of the philosophy of spirit, right? Sure, yeah. But I think at this point, Hegel just want, will want to say just what spirit is as such. Yeah before specifying Good. it further. Yeah, okay, so, so the next up having the concept of spirit is, I, it was interesting to read this because it's kind of like a, uh, a spark notes version of what Hegel thinks is self-consciousness. Uh, it's kind of like a brief introduction to the phenomenology of spirit in many ways. But it's also philosophy of spirit. Also philosophy of spirit, yeah, because he it, talks about yeah. the distinction between humans and animals and yeah, it is. is all, yeah, yeah. Go on. Which is all. It's interesting that he thinks that this is a relevant subject. That he. It's interesting that he thinks that he needs to make this introduction beforehand, um, because I guess he really wants to make the point that I guess one way that you might. So what one concern that Hegel might have about his project is again the skeptical position, which is. Well, there isn't this underlying rationality in, in the world. It's just a, a series of contingent events. Uh, there isn't this underlying necessity. And I guess one way that Hegel might try to motivate his position is to say, well, look, 
we've got human beings doing these actions. Human beings are, what is it about human beings that makes them such that the reasons for their actions are different to say animals? Um, well, it might be because they're rational beings and it might be because they have spirit. And then because of this, you can then sort of give a, a, a bigger view of world history and say, well, if the individual human has this sort of relationship with the world, this rational relationship with the world that we can make a sense of, then maybe it stands to reason that the collective progress of humanity also has this rational relationship with the world. That, but that's one way that I thought of why this section is might be so important not just as an introduction to what spirit means but almost by way of argument in favor of a philosophical world history mm -hmm. yeah i would uh one could also try a different tack with regards to the skeptic and say okay let's just run with the thesis that everything is contingent and people will be just motivated by contingency they just happen to be in the situations they're in why choose certain desires and things satisfactions over other ones presumably you you want something that's better that's longer lasting because you were interested in satisfaction well you want you don't want to have some basic satisfaction that keep keep uh, needing to be repeated and leave you frustrated no you may, maybe you want something better right and so on and so forth and already once you make that transition there is at work a higher standard that transcends the whole contingent um circumstances altogether so <laughs> going from from that uh, standpoint you might work your way backwards into the other element that also needs to be at play for hegel without even assuming it's there so you can just yeah. do it like a socratic alenkis basically Mm -hmm. yeah very nice okay good so should we just dive into this then yeah um so so let's just maybe uh state it one more time like why like hegel has mentioned spirit but why isn't let's say the logical idea good enough So I suspect it's because when Hegel talks about the logic, when he conceives of that aspect of his philosophy, he thinks of it as being concerned with pure thought. And what makes pure thought pure is the idea that it is not concerned with anything is that it's it's bereft of any external attributes it's not yeah whereas the kind of he used the word concrete in the paragraph above what makes the what makes the kind of thought we're getting at in world history concrete what makes spirit concrete is that it's it's thought specifically actualized in certain be it uh corporeal beings as in the beginning of the philosophy of spirit or in certain institutions like law or in certain art or in art or in religion or what have you it isn't just the concept that is purely itself it's It's the concept that has concreteness, that is something concrete. 
I think that's the distinction. And when we're looking at world history, what we're thinking about is very concrete things. We're going to be looking at deeds, as we said. Mm -hmm. What do you think? So maybe it's helpful to just give a brief definition of what makes something concrete for Hegel. And mm -hmm. I think one, we can just make it as simple as, well, the concrete is a unity of something and its other, such that uh, spirit is what is embodied and knows itself to be embodied, yet is not entirely just embodied as such. So what I mean is that mm -hmm. Uh, as we as Hegel will get to in the concept of spirit, because he starts talking about thinking, right? Well, it's not just pure thinking, it is conscious thinking, right? So, and consciousness is all about subject and object divisions. Yeah. So it is the mind that is embodied and conscious is in a world that is defined by subject object relationships, yet also transcends that relationship because it knows <laughs> precisely this right that these are just yeah. conscious um, pr uh, parameters or relationship set up by consciousness and not necessarily how the thing is in itself because ultimately actuality is or reality is just one right there isn't two realities or two dimensions or uh, you know the realm of thinking suspended above and beyond the realm of natural things yeah okay my my only qualm with that or rather maybe it's with hegel and i don't want to go too off piece here is saying that concreteness is the unity of something with its other would not capture a lot of aspects of the logic where we get purely conceptual moments that are unified with their other yeah but as as pure logic as other as other logical moments yeah. so here yeah. it would be a un a unity that would be more radical cross more radical divisions such as the logical and the non-logical exactly good yeah such as space and time yeah so the other that we're talking about is yeah maybe external externality uh, spatial temporality maybe to take the most fundamental concept of the philosophy of nature or of the sort of external philosophy if we want mm -hmm. yeah okay yes i agree with your worry there that uh, there are certainly a lot of concrete concretizations within the um, science of logic but those are within the rubric of uh, still pure thinking yeah yeah I mean, it would be, yeah it would be interesting to see the connection between those uses in the logic of calling a concept concrete and its use outside of the logic mm -hmm. maybe a second phd <laughs> we'd be far later <laughs> okay right uh philip um i'm gonna i'm gonna do a little plug here you teach a course on Hegel's phenomenology of spirit. That's right. So you're like an expert on Hegel's theory of consciousness. So could you like give us like a summary of what's going on in the first two, three paragraphs here? A summary of what's going on of the two, two three paragraphs. Uh, because so, Hegel yeah. talked Hegel discussing consciousness. Yeah. Mm. Well, I think I um, hinted a little bit to it in what I said previously, that consciousness is marked by subject-object divisions. So Hegel says pretty simply, I have consciousness insofar as I am self-consciousness. That is, I know something over against me, something outside me, only insofar as in it, I know myself, and I define, define the other as what makes possible my knowing of my own determinations in it. 
Hence, I am not just one thing or another, but I am that of which I know. So, so in the phenomenology of spirit, Hegel kind of goes through these shapes of consciousness and he lists kind of the most basic one, which is sense certainty, which is classed as consciousness, but then shows that there's always something more at work in these things, such that, well, we need to keep updating our idea of what we think consciousness is. And eventually that turns into self-consciousness, which is not really self-awareness. Um, it's something more immediate than self-awareness on Hegel's score. It's, it's better translated almost like self-confidence because in order for you to be self-confident, you have a sense of, you know, you're putting your really value on yourself and you're the center of the world. And that is kind of like what self-consciousness is doing in, the, in its beginning. It's that it's uh, operating under um, the notion that it is the essential and that everything out there, the object or whatever else is unessential. And yet it needs to relate has some sort of relationship with the other things through which it gains a sense of itself as essential. And that basically becomes desire for Hegel. Okay. And then that <laughs> leads into really ruinous things, you know, the notorious struggle to the death, master and slave stuff. Uh, but then that uh, keeps on developing further and then we get reason. Mm. And uh, which is uh, trying to um, rise above the um, uh, subject-object dichotomy that is kind of marked consciousness since its inception. And this isn't to say that for Hegel, consciousness is something untrue or, you know, all cried false. Phenomenologically, it's doing its thing really well. But I think Hegel wants to prove a philosophical point or a metaphysical point that if we are going to cash out everything that about what we is, what we are, what is thinking, what is reality, and so on, in the terms of consciousness, in phenomenological terms, well, you're going to have a bad time. <laughs> you're going, you're not going to, yeah, it's not going to be fully coherent or self-referential, which yeah. is what reason demands, right? So, great, um, yeah, that was really good. I, I, I would definitely take your course. <laughs> Okay, Thank good. You, <laughs> and so, okay, and so I guess one of the reasons why Hegel is talking about self consciousness is because this idea, what does he say? He says, knowing myself is inseparable from knowing an object. Like this, this sort of relationality then is going to play an important role in the relationship that humanity has to the external world the part of it's only by being self-conscious that we're then able to imbue the world let's say with certain acts of will certain desires uh interests that we have and and i suspect this is what we'll but i think we're getting too far ahead of ourselves right now um well, actually, I don't know how much in detail we want to go here. <laughs> well, um, let me just add something else, because yeah. this is a kind of worry or question that comes up a lot for um, regards to Hegel and consciousness. So what Hegel is setting out isn't at all what he th how a kind of theory of how the brain works and mm -hmm. what empirically makes something conscious. He is just interested in evaluating the standard, the logical presuppositions we bring with us whenever we have the kind of conscious experience that we're having. And he's distilling that in pure terms, in categorical terms, right? So his account of this is a logical one. That is, you can think of more in terms of like, if so-and-so obtains, then this must follow, right? It's not about question of when this and that obtains and how this and that obtains. That's an empirical thing and that's a whole different discipline. Then that's fine. But oftentimes we will bring with us these presuppositions, these ideas, of what we think consciousness is, already before we start analyzing, you know, neurological activity and brains and so on, empirical observations with regards to consciousness. 
And Hegel is kind of, is kind of telling people as a philosopher, stop, stop right there. You're already bringing with you a sense of what you think the thing is, the object that you're looking at. Let's unpack that sense, look closely at it, and see if it's coherent, you know, onto itself. So that's kind of the mm. the deal. Nice. Okay. And okay, and then so he's got this sort of um, he starts telling this story of how self-conscious begins. So it begins with sort of feeling, he says, which is the sort of immediacy. Um, and we have drives, and we wait no. Good, yeah, we have drives. And this is what we have in common with animals, Hegel says. Um, but we're not just this moment of immediacy, right? As you said, we're not just thinking within ourselves. We're also, And we're not just immediately thinking of what there is outside of us and responding to stimuli. We're also internalizing what's outside of us and positing it and to use hegel's word we are making it ideal uh ideal mm -hmm. there's a very nice footnote here uh by the editors maybe it's worth reading uh Hegel uses the adjective ideal to designate something empirically, empirically real that has, by the power of thought, been transposed into or given the quality of ideality, which is the truth of the finite. So it seems to me that he Hegel is trying to make, make an important point, which is that we're not just like animals. We're not just responding to external stimuli. We have this extra step this 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 further moment where we actually can posit we can we can take something external from us and imbue it with our rationality uh to make something empirically real and give it the um and, and give it the quality of ideality and i think this is what concrete spirit must be right it's imbuing things that would otherwise just be sheer externality with um, the dynamic activity of thought. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's half the story. There's another logical component that needs to be the case mm -hmm. for this to uh, to uh, to work. Um, do you do you have an idea what this what this could be what it presupposes? I think you have to tell me, Philip. If things around me and my perception are to be moments of me, of uh, you know, uh, ideal sen uh, uh, sense of myself, what is it that that presupposes in order for these to become moments? that you are able to take them as moments? No, that just repeats it. That they are also rational? Mm -mm. No. I th uh, it's at the first line of the next paragraph. Hegel kind of sets it out. The specific objective can be something wholly universal if no, 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 the beginning of the former paragraph. Sorry. Ah, it's all right. What robs human beings of this immediacy is that they have themselves as their own objects. They know of and about themselves and are inwardly present to themselves. This is the being of thinking. Okay. So, in order, so what I'm thinking is that in order for you to posit things out there, or even things within you, feelings and whatever you're, whatever you're having as moments, 
there is a self that is presupposed of which those things are moments of a unified something right okay. an inwardness and i think that's what hegel's getting at hmm. simply that uh so the yeah. the idea so when he says that that they have themselves as their own objects it's, it's the idea is self-consciousness is the taking of yourself as an object um so the o- term object here can be a, a little bit tricky misleading because you you can't take yourself as a thing which would mm-hmm. be a you know a bad thing to do hmm it's more of like um being aware that things are in relation to you okay as a, as a, as a subject of the issue of the matter so in human beings having an interest in themselves well they posit themselves as the thing in which something else out there is in relation to mm-hmm. otherwise okay. i think you collapse in the immersion that animal has they are just fully out there with their situation there's no depth to their experience if there is there's depth no, it's kind of like contingent there's no universality right that's the idea right just thinking is knowledge of the universal yes as something wholly simple and inward i am something wholly universal and i'm thinking now this must be connected to his repeated pronouncements that what we're interested in philosophical world history is discerning the universal so yeah 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 but notice that okay if we are going to think about this universal that is or this inwardness that is present to myself right if we focus in on that what is this thing is it this table i'm touching right is it um you know how i think of myself in the last two years in my lifetime name any determinate uh, quality or or thing and it will always fall short mm-hmm. because this inward present thing is something simple wholly yeah. simple hegel says yeah and i think this is the point at which later sartre kind of picks up on and has his solo spiel with nothingness right you try to identify as that waiter you think all that you are is you know this programmer or that investor or uh this mother or father or what or this philosopher yeah it, no you're not you're more than that you're you're always transcending all these roles and if you're trying to point out what it is you are you as you really are inwardly mm-hmm. come, you're going to come up empty there's nothing okay and it's all nothing everywhere equally nothing but it has within it the universal so there that is that is the universal that it is yeah. equally empty all around for everyone but it, it's this sort of indeterminate simplicity that when you posit will become it's, it's what's going to give what you posit significance it will turn it into a moment like you spoke of earlier yeah. the first half of the story yes exactly okay yeah a positive content in the simplicity and does itself become simplified i.e. ideal and this is why hegel drones on about why it doesn't matter if someone has the greatest ideas in the world if they don't do something about it if they don't actualize them mm-hmm. it's not a topic for world history right yeah because they're just this simple universal there's no passion has no yes. arms yeah yes what good is an uh, is an idea without arms <laughs> right <laughs> what a bizarre thought because human beings know the real as the ideal and know themselves as ideal they cease being merely natural they cease living in their immediate intuitions in their drives and satisfactions and in their productions okay 
With animals, this is not the case because for animals, there is a constant connection between drive and satisfaction, a connection that can be interrupted only outwardly by pain and fear, not inwardly. Mm -hmm. That's how Hegel cashes it out. Yeah. The relationship between the two. Good. Okay. It's all about the inwardness that self consciousness generates, which is universal insofar as every self consciousness shares this. Mm -hmm. Because there is nothing externally with which you can use to determine it. Okay. And anything you, anything self consciousness, self consciousness brings itself to is conscious of therefore becomes a moment for self consciousness right it becomes the part of its own simplicity yeah so i think uh just maybe mention you know in defense of animals <laughs> or sods uh you know they can they can become more intelligent and smarter right they are yeah. they can be cunning innovative and all of these things hegel's not going to deny that but you won't see a cat, you know, asking themselves, why am I actually meowing? Mm -hmm. Whereas, whereas for a human being, this, this becomes something of a necessity that we seem to have questions that come out of nowhere about our situation, right? Hegel's going to get to that, I think, in a bit, a bit later below. Hegel connects the universal with freedom here. Mm -hmm. Human beings can posit this freedom as their aim or purpose. They know what it is, what determines them. It is knowledge of themselves and of their will, which is, uh, there's a lot of stuff packed into that, right? Because yeah. first of all, he's kind of saying that you can think that, you know, getting a new car or getting this job or, uh, you know, being, having this partner or, uh, getting that salary, all of these things might fulfill you, but uh, um, but but these are just kind of values and things you've already put on those things before you got invested in them and engaged in them in those things outside of you. So what's really gonna um, ultimately, I think, be a fulfillment and satisfaction is if you turn your gaze inward and look upon the thing that is looking upon all the things in your life, so to speak, mm -hmm. which is self-knowledge, which is philosophy. So a knowledge of themselves and of their will, not a will of this or that particular thing, this or that contingent thing. Yes, those are at play, but in terms of ultimacy, what's, you know, what's really going on, we have to transcend beyond, above those, um, situations those standards that just are just immersed in those situations so every time i every time humans posit something um that moment the car the salary whatever is posited with the universality of the the individual's inwardness and that and that's an expression of their will. Mm -hmm. um, that's what uh, it's what makes humans volitional beings, as he writes. Mm -hmm. But the is it the true universality, the true freedom, is when we recognize that the is when we, when we recognize that it is the the positing of our universality in all these moments when we make that positing explicit to ourselves, that's when we have proper freedom. Is that what you're saying? Uh, in terms of um, knowing it, yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay, good. So uh, maybe take an example. You, you can, you can, you know, you love hamburgers. You, you keep on eating hamburgers and Hegel will say, yeah, you're free to do it. And your freedom is being expressed in you looking at the hamburger and thinking it's the greatest thing in the world. And you're just going to gobble it up and keep on piling in, right? Because you've decided this is, this is, this is my life. This is what it's all about. This is, this is the universal. This is the universal, right? But Hegel's going to then 
step in and say, well, do you really think that's the universal, this particular thing? What about the relationship that defines your value to that thing? Surely that must be more universal than the thing itself, because the thing is just a moment of this, right? And <laughs> eating a hamburger, you're turning that hamburger into a moment of you. So in the very act itself is a practical example of idealization that you are like turning it physically into a moment of you. Um, but we're just speaking uh, on terms of, on the level of experience. Yeah. Yeah. Fair. So this is, this is all just implicit freedom, but if you really want to figure out what it's, how your freedom is structured, what's going on, okay, I got to explicate what's going, uh, what's going on in between you. And okay. Thing. So let's, let's then connect this again with world history because we've uh we've strayed a bit uh oh we're following the text very close what are we doing in world <laughs> what are we looking for in world history we're looking for the self-actualization of freedom humanity we're looking at we're looking at human beings human individuals what it is to be human is to have this simple inwardness that is the sort of that is that is the universal it is sort of the wellspring of our freedom uh what it is for us part of what it is for us to be free is for us to posit this inner universality this inner freedom and to make external moments uh, external things moments of ourselves moments of our universality moments of our freedom and because of this these things these acts these institutions are pertinent objects of study for philosophical world history because they are moments of our freedom yes and that's what we're studying the, exactly. the, the progress of our freedom yes very good that's very nicely expressed um those so like not everything falls under history right me eating right. breakfast or uh that guy getting this or that car whatever right yeah it's only things that speak to our uh, um freedom in an objective sense yeah yeah right? we're gonna get yeah he's yes. gonna yeah we need to talk about objectivity eventually yeah so it will be about values we all share um systems of government institutions uh habits uh events that uh bring in a lot of people these that that becomes the material for history because it expresses um our freedom in a higher register than sort of individual uh kind of particular contingent things mm -hmm. yeah good yeah that, that actually raises a good question because up until now someone could be reading this and think there isn't yet a justification for why we should distinguish certain acts from other acts why uh, why shouldn't hamburger eating be part of philosophical world history uh aside from the obvious reasons <laughs> uh but yeah good okay i guess we need to answer that eventually as well yeah it i mean it could still have a particular history of you know hamburger cuisine fall under the history of food and so on but of course these are all things that are about the particular thing not about our relationship to the particular which is what is of interest yeah uh philosophically i think yeah okay okay so, so we, go to, we yeah. should uh, we should talk about recollection as hegel brings it up here okay because uh, that's at least uh very a little bit because it's a very nice play of on words i don't know if you noticed it but i only just noticed it today when i was reading this that um we've spoken about inwardness and inwardness being key for things out there becoming ideal moments of mm -hmm. us, right? Entering into the simplicity, the sphere of simplicity, we might say. Uh, but then Hegel talks about recollection and the German is Erinnerung. Erinnerung. So it's inwardness making. Oh, very good. Yeah. So whenever Hegel has a kind of pun or play on words, this is, this is like super important. Mm. <laughs> Pay attention. <laughs> good, yeah, so, yeah. So let's just read that uh, sentence where he mentions it. Recollection is the source of human beings, freedom and universality 
of determination in accord with purposes, which can be the most universal or singular. As a result, their immediacy and naturalness are broken. It is this inwardness that makes human beings autonomous. Really interesting. So because he's calling it a source, I think it falls under a kind of power, right? That we have, that, that we do. Um, and it sort of then becomes a substance rather than a, cat- a pure category. See what I mean? You're going to have to explain that. Um, so I would say, you know, determinate being is a pure category or a number is a pure category. Um, you find instances of those things around in the world, but no thing in the world is those things, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Or even a concept, right? You don't dig up a concept from the ground, you think it. Mm-hmm. Um, but recollection here, in calling it a source, I think is more of a kind of um, a particular natural power. Well, I mean, as we've emphasized, we're talking about concrete spirit. And so we're not just thinking about pure thought, but concrete thought, and we're talking about embodied beings. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is is that maybe one way that we could think about why Hegel wants to talk about as a sort of a natural power? Maybe there is a kind of... uh certain natural operate operation that we can speak about that is in the service of freedom universality that is particularly um, proximate to human being self-consciousness and and thinking Mm -hmm. even though i think i remember reading elsewhere that Rec- memory itself for Hegel is doesn't is very mecha- is something very mechanical. It is it is a bit strange, yeah. But he says it is it's it's where immediacy and naturalness are broken. I understand why. So if I just un- understand recollection as a placeholder for inwardness, universality, freedom, then it makes sense why. It's the breaking point. Uh, it's what it's what uh, leads to a breaking point with immediacy and naturalness. I just don't understand entirely why recollection or memory should be the source of this. Maybe. Um, Maybe it's uh, there to hold whatever thing you're dealing with as yeah. a moment exactly that's it yeah. that's it yeah because if you couldn't remember the moments that you posited they would just be immediacies and you would never be able to then understand your positing of them as moments of your own universality you would never be able to get to that point if you never mm-hmm. if you didn't have recollection yeah Though it is, is it, it is worrisome that he brings it out here, because up until this point, we've strictly been speaking about things on the level of spirit, right? And what distinguishes yeah. spirit from natural being. The recollection seem, seems to be more part of natural being, right? Well, I mean, it's the thing that breaks apart the human being from naturalness, so maybe not. Maybe he's... Uh... <laughs> Maybe he's drawing a connection with Plato. Recollection. <laughs> yes, that could also be the case. Unlikely. Well, oh, we can uh, we can put a pin on it. It'd and, be interesting uh, to see what people think about this. Actually, I mean, they are lecture notes. Maybe. Well, he does speak of memory in. Um, in the philosophy of spirit of course yeah, right? yeah so it is there yep it is and i think it's in the section of consciousness 
maybe psychology. I think it's psychology. Absolutely. That would be my guess. Yeah. Shall we move on? Yeah, let's move on. So the rest of the paragraph is just a, um, I think it's just a continuous restatement of the point. Uh, yes, uh, there are a few things that I want to pick up on. Go ahead. Uh, one thing is that the thing about spirit is not that it's an immediate being, but it's a being that returns into itself. Mm -hmm. And we should understand this return, Hegel goes on to qualify, not as coming back from a state that was already there. Yeah. So in a way, you're coming back from nothing because you're coming back from something that never was there to begin with. And yet you are coming back <laughs> to yourself. But all of that, what he really means, it's trying to, what it's trying to express is that spirit is only what, makes of, what it makes of itself by its own activity. So history is, to take that as an example, only is history insofar as there are historians doing history, thinking about it, thinking about what happened and uh, figuring out what it means and so forth. Mm -hmm. So it's one of those, as an activity of spirit, it is, follows its main principle of being what, has, what it has made itself into, which is completely different from natural being, which would you find yourself in space and time embodied in this body. You didn't have a say in that. You gotta, you know, <laughs> do what you, you can do with the, the cards you're dealt. But then whatever else follows, ah, that, that becomes spiritual. Right, and this is, it becomes concretely spiritual. Well, it is just spiritual. I don't think there is spiritual without something, without the being that returns to into itself. Right, but even our even in our sort of our inward state, it's still spirit, right? It's just simple. It's not. Well, it's a simplicity that's generated mm. from okay. returned to itself, so to speak. It's not that that simplicity was there, and then we just add things to it. Mm. It happens simultaneously with you understanding positing this and that wham you got the simplicity kind of being at play there mm -hmm. yeah okay yeah because hegel doesn't want to speak about the simplicity of self-consciousness prior to any being or experience of self-consciousness no right yeah, they, that would just break actuality yeah right and so the way he kind of works around that is by stating that it's what you have made yourself into. Hmm. So in a way where this kind of a, speaks a little bit to the Owl of Minerva aspect of his thinking, that <laughs> when you're thinking, when you're having a thought, you're already at the end of the party. Right? It's, it's, you've, you know, you're, you might be, I don't know, studying something, whatever, you don't understand it, but then it clicks, right? Mm -hmm. You've returned to yourself. Uh, with that sense, right? But it's not that you can speak of that thing before it, that thought before it happened. It doesn't make sense. It's not like the th thought was, you know, ready made simple and then plus add the thing and then now it's the synthesis. I think this is the kind of thinking that Hegel wants to get away from. And he mm -hmm. thinks this doesn't, it's just a hap hypothetical way of thinking that presupposes already the concrete. It's hypothetical because it, it imagines what it would be like to think without an external world. It, yeah, it imagines thoughts to exist without thinking, basically. Yeah. You have a simplicity of self-consciousness. Now you add the diff element of difference. There you have concrete self-consciousness. But yeah. Hegel says, no, you have the concrete self-consciousness first <laughs> in actuality. And that needs to be respected. Mm. Um, that was the first thing I wanted to um, bring out. Do you want to say anything to that, or do you want me to bring out the next? No, that was one? excellent. No, no, I've got nothing to add. Um, I think that is just a really beautiful point, and it yeah, again it is. folds in so nicely 
with the rest of the system because the logic is what is most immediate through reason, right? Then you have nature, it's alienation, but then you have spirit, which is return. So it works both on a systematic level with regards to philosophy and concrete actuality. Yeah. Good. Excellent. Yeah. And then I uh, just want to... Uh, yes, I think this is mentioned already, but because Hegel talks about it, I just want to bring it up again. Human beings are spiritual beings. They must acquire everything. So this is on page uh, 151. Human beings must acquire everything for themselves. They must make themselves into what they ought to be and what otherwise would remain a mere potentiality. They must cast mm -hmm. off the natural. Thus, spirit is humanity's own achievement. Mm -hmm. So given what he's talked about before with regards to, to spirit being the return, not being something that was already there, ready-made, something that cannot be immediate like natural being. Well, what, of, what all of this means is that as spiritual beings, we have, to, as mind, minded beings, we have to make it um, happen to ourselves. It cannot be taken for granted. That therefore means that historical achievements should also fall under the same way of framework, that those cannot be taken for granted either. And I think this speaks against this whole of caricature of Hegel as having this uh, progression towards history that is just kind of providence. Mm -hmm. uh, because, he, because he emphasizes the activity, the making of history by individuals. He emphasizes that anything that mind does has to be made by mind itself. It cannot rely on anything outside of it mm -hmm. to provide it with its sense. Right. So nature doesn't tell us what it what it is and what it's doing. We need to be a poke and prod it and figure it out. Yeah. Uh, but that is how we gain understanding in science and so on, and how we pretty much gain anything else that is of a that speaks to our humanity. Mm -hmm. That yeah. doesn't speak to our natural being, but it speaks to our human being. So and I yeah. So, and thus spirit is humanity's own achievement in the sense of we have to posit our universality in the world yes and and even to think universality is also an achievement philosophy is an achievement science is an achievement thinking it is an achievement uh, it doesn't follow from anything outside of itself or externally that it does happen so so this kind of is, I think this is a really radical uh, thought by Hegel because it really makes a break with nature. It'd be interesting to think more about this idea of thinking as an achievement because obviously Hegel thinks the, the side of nature is crucial. It is crucial that we are embodied. It is, it yeah, is, yeah. Yeah. It is, it is a fact that we are partially conditioned by our environment and by what we find immediately outside of ourselves and yet and yet the achievement involves casting off the natural so it's it's he's simultaneously accepting the conditionedness of externality whilst carving out a, a, a particular space for spirit where spirit goes over and above it. it it's so what I think he means when he says cast off the natural is not that we dismiss the natural yeah but we cast off the natural standard yeah. the standard of nature or the standard of immediacy to take simply things for granted right yeah that i think is what he yeah uh, i think i think wants to cast off. especially in the context of what he's been talking about uh, with respect to um um 
the difference between humans and animals, it seems that the casting off the natural in the context of con self consciousness, feel uh, self consciousness is this casting off of the immediacy, as you said, of the of of not being stuck in this immediate relationship with nature, but um, understanding the um, the mediated relationship actually. And making yourself a new immediacy through the mediated relationship. Mm. But One, recollecting that immediacy throughout. Right. But in accord with the mediated standard, not the immediate standard. Exactly. Yeah. He makes a nice uh, kind of example animals vis a vis humans. Animals are born nearly complete, he says. It's no, right. Yeah. right? There's no change. If you're born yeah. a cat, you're going to stay a cat the rest of your life. It's a yeah. done deal. There might be some strengthening going on of you know, you know of, of various different things, but cat's gonna stay a cat. What is a human being gonna stay as? You know, the, he thinks we are born incomplete. Yeah. <laughs> it's an interesting way of putting it. And that's a, a, a good thing. Huh? One sort of tantalizing thought about this, this achievement. It's in the, the final section of the last paragraph of the previous page, page 150. Uh, the people and its activity is this endless craving for the fruit. But a taste of this portion of this potion poisons the people's existence, destroying them. And the fruit again becomes seed. Seed in principle than other people, which it vitalizes and brings to maturity. So even this achievement is not entirely positive. This achievement will lead to its own self-destruction, but also its own self-propagation. Mm -hmm. It will be the achievement of a people. Hegel makes a really interesting point that a people begins to decline. This is later on, I think, in the progress. A people begins to decline when it has achieved its universality and it just goes through the motions, so to speak, and no longer has a higher end to, mm -hmm. to to strive for and i think he's he's pointing to it here in this more abstract uh conversation about uh about consciousness mm -hmm. it's there is this he talks about the seed and the fruit yes but i wonder if this paragraph kind of illustrates uh, the futility of living life accordance to the natural standard I, I don't think it necessarily means the 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 more free standard that can be achieved um, okay because it has even even the analogies here is all about kind of living things veg like um vegetative life and animal life and so on right which if you think of of that as a as a standard you're going to get frustrated <laughs> because in your developments and what you do mm -hmm. produce um you will enjoy less and less and your capacity to produce will will um diminish and so on and so forth so and yet conceptually, which is a nice point he puts in here, right, is that what you're striving to towards in you, you being a parent, let's say, is for your children to grow up. But conceptually, you've already been a child. So you've achieved what you're trying to produce. So there's a double <laughs> uh, bitter fruit to taste there, right? Um, yeah. But I think this is all under the uh, umbrella of, of na natural okay. life. Okay. That will, will frustrate one if one looks for development in cycles. You won't be fulfilled okay. by development in cycles. You'll be fulfilled by development in the realm of development, which is spiritual activity. Okay. Yeah. Okay. But okay. But I, I think I still think there is an interesting parallel, though, with what he says later on. Okay. And. Um, Oh, I guess we can talk about that when we get to that. Okay, so we've spoken about how 
spirit sort of develops in humans we haven't yet looked at how it works in history and i think this is what we're going to start looking at now in the next three subsections the beginning of history the progress of history and the much more infamous end of history uh i think maybe we should maybe we were too ambitious for this episode and maybe we should uh deal with those in a in a in a further episode what do you think yeah yeah that that is fine yeah the internet is infinite because the human <laughs> mind is infinite so we can keep on piling more and more erinnerungen onto it no problem Good. hopefully okay, it then. will remember us <laughs> well the important thing is that we remember ourselves right yeah <laughs> that is the that is the important thing like really rem remember ourselves in a platonic fashion mm. yeah yeah, I think uh, we got a lot out today and I, we kind of, Hegel gives us the, he doesn't, I, I don't think he's given us a logical derivation of what spirit is because no, no. he does that elsewhere, yeah. but he gives us an account of the core concept that he thinks is at work in history. Mm -hmm. And for the benefit of his students, us, right, you, view, you the viewer, he gives us the, the main thing now so that we have it in view when we then keep on going because we're still part of the introduction here right yeah so very much uh, so. yeah in the actual development then you know in immediacy of history people don't know freedom is is what they're after what they are what they are what they think they're after is, well they have an know, idea of freedom that isn't quite right yeah they think of it as you know being the greatest conqueror uh history has ever known right they might, they might think that is that is freedom right that'll that'll make me free all right <laughs> yeah not so much in india <laughs> <laughs> all right well thanks for uh tuning in and yeah. uh, please uh follow us along as we keep digging deeper into this uh wonderful wonderful uh, lecture series yeah great work philip you too Helias. keep right, it ideal <laughs> The only way I can. <laughs> All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.